Hello, everybody. This is Joda Lawyer, and welcome to my Analog Man Cave YouTube show. All right, today we're gonna figure we'd uh, show you some classic black and white D and D art from back in the day because we're talking about stuff back in the day. We're talking about how to make five E D and D players, uh, how, how to get them to adjust to OSR gaming and all the old school style, right? So, how, how do you bring them into your campaign? Now, this came up because I'm starting, as you know. A second edition campaign. I think I've got four or five videos right now on the prep, what I'm doing for it. Just released one this weekend. Check it out. But then this guy, he's about my age, about 50. And he hasn't, he used to play the old games back like we did when we were kids, but he hasn't played in decades, right? Like 30 years ago. And so I'm bringing him in. We've been playing together for the last couple of years, and he's a good player. We've been playing my fifth edition campaign, and he plays in my brother's fifth edition campaign. So he's a good player. And uh, good DM, too. I mean, you know, talking about different things in his campaign. So, but everything comes from this 5e mindset, right? All the old, old school skills or whatever have atrophied. And so we're texting back and forth all day the other day about, what about this and what about that? And I was sort of explaining it's not really necessary. It's not in this style. Uh, it wouldn't work, whatever it may be. So I was just trying to get it through to him. I was like, listen, listen this is what you should expect. This is how to think. These are the... These are the, the 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 ways of viewing the second edition campaign that you're maybe not used to viewing through the fifth edition lens. And so, geez, I'm like, oh, you know, this is a lot of texting here. I probably got enough for a decent video because I think a lot of people could be interested. Now, I've told you guys in the past to how to you know how to run an old school game as a DM, and I said definitely first pick up Matt Finch's old school primer because it's fantastic. Right now. That that is a good book, but it, it it's it's broad and it hits, hits all the relevant points. But in terms of the nitty gritty, I figured might need another video. Might need to show how to just talk to them one on one instead of they understand what your campaign is all about. That they understand what you're going to be doing and how you're going to be doing it. And I figured I'd just go through what I talked about with my friend and uh, you know tell you where we're at. So you know I thought I what I was telling them is that basically back in the day. We don't remember what we did, but I guarantee you we didn't do it right. <laughs> we didn't do it by the rules. We made our crap up as we went. We had our flawed 14-year-old kid-brained interpretations of things, and uh, we ran with it. Everybody had a good time. And that's part of the whole game is make up your own rules. You know, house rule the crap out of everything, as you've seen. I have my long house rules, and just have fun. But you do have a different experience, a different play experience. Now, now he's thinking about making up a thief, all right? Um, and I call them thieves, not rogues, even though it's second edition. They're a damn thief because that's kind of what they do. I'm not going to you know, pussyfoot around the, the names and all that. Now, he is uh, he's looking at it from a, a, a good perspective because I told them to take a look at the one of the few things that those you know complete handbooks of whatever the heck they put out in the second edition day was a thief's handbook. And I said, check it out because there's a lot of thieves tools in there that could help bump up your percentages on various things you might want to see and just I, I said i remember they're really good some of them some of them maybe broke the game so run things by me before you purchase anything with your starting cash and he started reading for the flavor and he got into that as well and i said well geez if you want to read for flavor look at lankmar the the thieves of lankmar book i think nigel finley put it out it was the best thieves book ever made ever in any edition of the game it was freaking fantastic so he's he's do, he's doing this and he's putting a lot of work into the guy right and i said to him you know man <laughs> it's the first thing i said about the conversion i said you're putting so much into the background most people back in the day we didn't name our dude until we got to like third or fourth level because chances are he's not going to make it you're putting a lot of work into a guy who may not live <laughs> beyond the first couple adventures but he says you know he likes that because it helps him with the immersion factor and i get that because for me, the immersion factor is keeping track of all the nitty gritty. How many arrows? How many coins? You know, who do we talk to? What did they say? I take a lot of notes. I'm, I'm that guy at the table. Um, so, so basically, the, the the next step was to get him to wrap his mind around the fact that it's not optimized for combat. The only thing that's really optimized for combat are the fighters, rangers, paladins, things like that. A thief is not a combat class. Um, it, so it, the game is not combat focused like the newer third, fourth, or fifth edition is. I said, here, here's the thing that I, that I may, maybe if you take away nothing else from this video, take away this. Don't focus on your role in combat. Focus on your role in the adventuring party because adventuring isn't all about combat in the old school days. All right. It's about a lot of other things. It's a lot. It's about, about exploring. It's about uh, seeing weird magic stuff, being, being creeped out. It's, it's a little bit of horror maybe. It, there's a lot to it 
that, that has nothing to do with combat. Most of it doesn't have to do with combat. One of the biggest reasons is, is because of what you're looking at in terms of uh, how do you get XP, all right? I'm running with gold, even though it's second edition and didn't come baked into it. I'm, I'm carrying over the fact that you get gold for XP. Okay, so I'm just, you get XP for gold. Jesus, have another shot. All right, so you, you get XP for gold. So to so get five gold pieces, that's five XP. Now think about this for a second because this is a, this is something you got to really consider. Let me let me pull up, uh, for example, sliding over this PDF or the owl bear. Right, the owl bear. You got 420 XP if you kill it. But look what you got to do to kill this son of a bitch. This guy's got a lot. He's got a lot of hit points. All right, he has five plus two hit dice. So five times eight plus two hit points right so what's he an average of in his 20s something like that and he's rocking damage one to six one to six and two to twelve he could do a hug and rend rend you and this and that now that's a lot of a lot of risk for a 420 xp but sort of look up here a little bit what i'm looking at here is the treasure because back then you had a different way of doing treasure El bear got treasure type c if he's in his lair okay now to look at the treasure type let's click at Dungeon Master's Guide. <laughs> That's how they roll back then. Treasure type C means there is a 20% chance of between 1,000 and 10,000 copper. 100 copper to a gold, guys. All right, 30% chance of between 1,000 to 6,000 silver. 10 silver to a gold, guys. That's a lot of freaking... If you pull that off, you get to max it out. That's 600 gold pieces, all right? The owl bear itself isn't even worth a four, only 420, all right? Move it along. 10% chance of 100 of 100 to 600 platinum, 25% chance of some gems, and they're not cheap, right? And then there's some art objects, One 20% uh, chance of one to three art objects, and then maybe a 10% chance of any two magic items, any two, not, not just potions or some crappy-ass magic, any two. That's worth something. Now, now, what makes more sense? To try to beat the crap out of this owlbear and take his stuff, or to try to take the owlbear's stuff, okay? That's all you got to do. This thing isn't smart. Okay, it has a has a low intelligence, five to seven. I, I've worked with some people a little, a little lower than that, but still, it's not that smart. Okay, so you, you lure him out, you do the old breadcrumb trail, you sneak into his lair, you take his stuff. There it is. So you're not folk, even though you're a fighter, you, you're better off not fighting sometimes, a lot of times, most of the time. Fight if you have to, but get the treasure by all means. It's like Conan the Barbarian in the movie where the first one, where they, they had to go uh, get the gem from that sleeping snake and somebody woke the snake up and they got like, oh, crap, now we got to fight the snake. They didn't want to fight the snake. They don't care. They want the damn gem. That's what you're looking at here in old school. So I, all that being said, the reason I'm saying this is because you shouldn't focus on combat with your class, even as a fighter. You want to be a little versatile on stuff, okay? What you want to do is focus on your role in the adventuring party, the exploration, the adventure, living the high life, getting back to town and blowing your money that you spend on, you know, wine, women, and song, and, or, you know, whatever it is that you want to do. But that that's what it's all about. But Fawford and the Gray Mauser and Conan, living that high life. And so this is what you're going to focus on. So if he's rolling up a thief, he has a lot of skills that he could use in a city, in a town, or in a dungeon, Okay. Don't think about adventure because you don't have to kill everything. Plus, don't forget monsters have morale. Monsters are great uh, because in, in, in old games, they, if, you were, if you're rocking them, you, you kill a bunch of the monsters, like a bunch of goblins or something. You, you nuke one with a fireball or a bunch of them. Next thing you know, they're scared to death. They got to make a morale check. They run away. Guess what? You get, you get partial XP if they run away too. And you can go get their treasure in their lair. <laughs> Bingo. You don't have to fight them. You don't risk death. Okay. You're going to get far more XP for getting the stuff than you are for getting, getting in a fight. So don't get in a fight. <laughs> That's the key. Now, they started talking about multi-classing. Now, multi-classing, I forbid it in 5e, but some, some DMs allow it. And it's a way to min-max a character to have a build. It goes back to, like, you know, MMOs and whatnot. We're going to build this thing so it's impervious and awesome and great, and you, you nobody can ever fight him or hurt him, blah, blah, blah. No, that's not how it works in old-school games. It is not a min-maxing game, okay? Um, he wanted to multi-class. This is not this is not the way to go because you're going to be you know an elf or a half elf I think is his character is a half elf and yeah he could be 150 years old and finally get to you know tenth level tenth level tenth level in his three classes. In the meantime, it took him so damn long to get there because you've got to split XP between all your classes, so you're only going up a third in each class as everybody else is going up a, a full level. You're going to take so long to get there. By the time you get in 10th level, 10th level, 10th level in every class, and you're finally meeting the, the, the levels of your companions, they've either gone above 10th level or they're dead because they're <laughs> right. So it's going to take a long time to get there. 
so it's not worth it. Multiclassing is more for flavor. If you can do an all all demi human group, yeah, then you might want to multiclass and say everybody gets two classes, and then everybody can, you know, it might be fun. But it's more for purposes of role playing, or if you want to make a utility kind of guy, it's a different way to create a bar because I hate bars and I forbid them. But if you're going to multiclass into three or four classes, boom, you got a lot of utility to the group. Never going to be great at anything, and your hit points are, you know, they're they're going to be definitely average or below average, but depending on the classes you pick, but still you got, you're, you're like a Swiss army knife then, right? You do a little bit of everything, but not really great at anything, but you're great if you're a good role player and it's a city adventure because then you got complete versatility. Okay. So that's another way to think about it. It's not about a mid maxing and what scores are going to go where we played a, a Hyperborea game is formerly called astonishing swordsman, a source of Hyperborea a couple of years ago. And my brother and I, and a friend of ours and, my brother's done with his character. They rolled up number, the, their ability scores at the same time. My brother finished his, and we're looking at the, the other guy, and he's like, where are you at, man? Are you, you almost done? Because I'm still trying to figure out where to put the scores. I'm like, mother God, what? They don't, they don't think about that. It doesn't make a damn bit of difference. He's trying to min-max the shit. Where, where's it going to make the most sense? And he's looking at everything under the sun. I'm like, dude, just it doesn't matter. It doesn't make a difference. Don't bother with that. So it's not a min-maxing game, okay? Now, if, you're, if you are t- talking about roles in in your adventuring party here here's the base of rundown fighters are combat guys clerics are secondarily combat guys that's why they get to use armor because here's the little known thing you, you can't heal without touching the dude so if a fighter's in the melee up in the fray with you know three ogres around him and he's down on hit points and the cleric needs to heal him he's got to run up into the melee area and risk and hit in the head by the by the giants or whoever he's fighting and touch him to heal him right mages just hide all that's all they do. They hide and they pew pew with darts and daggers or something like that. But every once in a while, they let loose the nuke. Okay, so they're all they're holding off. They're they're the red button. You push them, and all things are going wrong. They throw the sleep spell, their fireball, or you could use them as a utilitarian, uh, utility guy rather. If you look at it, you got, you got a bunch of scrolls, maybe a potion or something like that. You could cast knock spell, you cast locate object. Things like that are, are invaluable to a game. Because what, what you're doing is shortcutting around a whole lot of different things and problems and, and combats, because combats are problems you don't want to risk. Okay, so you're, you're, you're shortcutting around a whole lot of things with a good mage. It, was, it gives you a lot of versatility and power when you need it. Thieves are the best class, in my opinion, to where just the purely adventuring guys, they, they, they could do the most in the most situations. Fighter's not going to do much in terms of what skills does he have. Um, unless it's like a social thing and the guy, you know, the player is a good role player. But if you're just talking about the nuts and bolts of adventuring in a dungeon or something like that, the thief, you always want a thief with you. Unlike in fifth edition where it's like, ah, thieves, they suck, whatever. So many people could do so many of the abilities that thieves classically had that it doesn't make sense to have a thief. No, no, thieves are vital in this game. And I'm glad he's making one because the other guys are mostly fighters. So it's going to be good. And, and they have a lot they can do in cities and towns. So when you go back to sell, right? If you're going back to the village or the town to sell stuff, guess what? The thief's having a party there because he could do so. He, he could go stealing from rich people. He could, he could use uh, his information or sources or, 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 or break it and entering skills and, and get even more money. So everyone else is doing downtime. The thieves out there scoring big scores. Okay. Um, the other thing about five, eight, uh, about, old school games second edition that there's no social encounter rules you're not you're not you're not saying oh i'm going to try to intimidate okay d20 plus five no it doesn't work like that you just say what you're going to do and the dm says ah, i was good or that was bad and you see if you intimidated the guy you might take into account your character's charisma if your charisma particularly sucks and you can't speak right but you know that that's it there's no social encounter rules so you just wing it you're all play it out so thinking along those terms so many different uh, things can be taken care of via the means of social encounters that aren't based in any scores or roles or rules. It's just you talking to the DM or a bunch of other people in the group and, and you just figuring stuff out just like real life. So anybody could do that sort of thing. You don't need to min max that. So don't think about those sorts of things. Okay. Another thing to think about is hirelings. Now, a lot of people, they, they love them or they hate them. Right. But hirelings are those, those, you know, a, a zero level guy that you hire to, carry the chest or maybe uh, shoot an arrow from behind to the combat or stand by your side or be a shield bear, whatever it is. Um, the hirelings, they're, they're like weak ass. They're like red shirts, right? From the original Star Trek. But what they have is the ability to get better. Okay. Cause I have, I have a leveling system for hirelings. So they become first level guys over time, over several periods. You could all, and also you could expand the cape of uh, them into henchmen. Henchmen are like your right hand man. They're like uh 
they're basically like the mobsters uh, conciliary or whatever you know what i mean they get what it does having henchmen and hirelings is that they're not just the carry crap and there's oh i got a rule for this guy now i got to do this i got to roll for multiple people in the combat no what you do is you look at them as like a carrier group all right like a, like a u.s navy carrier group it's force projection okay a carrier is more powerful with all the destroyers and and cruisers and subs around it okay a carrier group is not just a carrier so you're if you're looking at an analogy your pc is a fighter and he's you don't you the player don't have to deal with a lot of crap you just want to run that pc without any sort of hirelings then what you're missing out on is force projection because while you're doing stuff this guy advances to henchman or something like that or a trusted companion you could have him do things in the background in town or in a different town and they come back and so you're 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 doing things even when your pc isn't doing things all right you'd be acting as a spy you could get information you could you could uh, carry out negotiations or handle things and maybe the dm will let you play that guy while those things are happening and so again it's all about force projection so don't think about it in terms of a burden all right so that's something any class could do um another thing to uh to say was he was saying that my god i have so much unlearning to do <laughs> i said i know it's a different way to think and he said he's starting to believe that his half of his own group would be better off with a game that wasn't so mechanically dependent i, said, I agree most people would but most people are so used to so many mechanics and having to have this mechanic for this and this mechanic for that that they don't know how to wing it all right and what the other thing people have coming into dnd is they look at dnd as a video game right and in a video game, you're like Ultima Online or Health. Oh, Jesus, I just dated myself. I'm EverQuest. I bet Meridian 59. Any Meridian 59 boys out there? <laughs> anyway, like a video game where you're in a video game, you're trying to optimize your character to beat the game. It's all combat, right? This is exploration. Like I said, adventure, living adventure is life. Offered in Gray Mouse or Conan. It's immersion into a fantasy world. You're not heroes per se to start with, and you're not, you don't have a heroic destiny. Uh, I, I guess I'll, I could end it with a with a couple of, of quotes here. Um, well, not quite in there because I got a few little more things to say, but I was looking at uh, Osric. It's old school reference and in index compilation. It's uh, it's an ADD clone, one of the first things that kicked off the OSR way back in 06, I think. And in the back of Osric, the second edition, there's a there's a back uh, the, the, the backlog prologue whatever the hell comes in <laughs> now i gotta look at it jesus christ i can't even can't even think of the name of it the afterward that's what it is and Stuart marshall wrote this right so it's the afterward and there's like it's really good you should read it because it, it, it goes along with matt finch who's actually co-wrote this book i think or wrote most of them i forget how it actually worked but it goes along with matt finch's old school primer it's almost like Stuart marshall's addendum to the old school primer read it it's really really good but and you can I think you guys work for free, so go download the PDF. But in the back of it, it says a couple of quotes that stood out. It says, "You are not entitled to be the hero. You might just get to be the hero, but don't expect it as a right." And I'm like, "That's it. That's that sums up so much in terms of a character's perspective, a player's perspective, of playing a character. You're not entitled to be a hero, but you might you might get there." And the other quote that really stood out is, "Your GM is not a storyteller for a reason. He or she isn't telling you a story." with you cast as the protagonist if you want that try one of white wolf's games the gm creates a world you create a character who wants something it's up to you to go out and get it story is the result of the game not a process within it beautiful right beautiful that's perfect that that's this so much in terms of the setting the pcs uh, that the players expectations for the pcs all right you're, you're not you're not you're not characters in some dm's fantasy fiction novel okay so Keep that in mind. And then the other thing I'll end with is start with solo adventures, okay? Especially if they're character, they're players who are, are coming into this game system that they have, have really have no experience or experience many decades ago playing old school games. The way Tim Schwartz does it from Gothridge Manor, it basically you have a solo adventure, a few hours you play, you get to you know kick the tires, you get to stretch your legs, you get to you try your character out in, in, in a safe setting in a way because... What I do is, unless they really screw up, they're not going to die. But what they will do is get to test out all the character's capabilities, right? They'll have the, they'll have a good chance to really take the car around the block and give it a test drive. Take that character out and give it, get the character a test drive and feel it out. The other thing a solo adventure lets you do is they can screw up. They can make mistakes. They could have rules, misunderstandings. They, they, could, they could act like idiots because they don't know what they're doing with the character because the character's new and they're not embarrassed to do so because there's not a lot of other players around, you know? It's like back to the car thing. It's like you're driving your, your car for the first time 
and you don't want any of your buddies to see you and mock you because you're in the parking lot with your father and you know he's yelling and screaming at you hit the fucking brake hit the br no the other you know so we all been there right <laughs> so you're panicking shit in your pants and your father's yelling at you you're hitting the brake hitting scash hitting the brake and you know you look like an idiot you don't want your buddies to see you doing that. They'll mock the shit out of you forever. And nowadays with freaking phones and videos, you'll never live that crap down, right? So this is what a solo mentor does. is You get to go out there, kick the tires, take the car around the block, and uh, hopefully the DMs on like your father and screams at you. <laughs> but <laughs> you, get to, you get to try it out and then explore it. And then maybe make some contacts, have some connections, bring a rumor or something that to the to the first adventure when all the rest of the players get there. My brother did something recently where we all brought a bit of a, a rumor. So that when we all put it together, we got the rumor that starts off the adventure. It was kind of cool. So we're sitting around the bar, of course. That's where they all start. And we all put our rumors together like a jigsaw puzzle. And boom, we got the big clue to start the game off. So like I said, start with solo adventures. And now for you guys who are running these games, I did a, a nice, good, long video about uh, how to run your first OSR style game. And so a lot of people thought it was good and just in terms of how to run any game. It wasn't even OSR as OSR specific as I thought it would be. So take a look at it if you're interested, guys. Um, and hope you enjoyed this video. Now, if you did, please hit like, comment, subscribe, and uh, and check out Tankar's Tavern Substack. All that stuff is, is linked in the bottom on my other ways to contact me because you got a lot of other old school YouTubers out there who were we're talking together and uh it's this reminds me of the blog days when we we're all sitting around blogging with each other so check that out and i hope you enjoyed it and share it out with your friends guys it's really uh it helps me a lot because i'm not the kind of guy who'll sit, sit there and do i gotta do five shorts a day and two live streams and 15 videos in order to get monetized i can't i don't have the time i got a day job right so I just so share it out if you like it and tell people about it and hopefully get more followers okay more yeah more subscribers all right well thank you very much and guys it's uh Wednesday night at 8.20 p.m., uh, the day before Thanksgiving. So anybody in America, have a great Thanksgiving. Anybody who's not in America, enjoy the World Cup. <laughs> All right. Anyway, take care, guys. Bye-bye.